It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carla Kearns, and you see all of her titles here. Um, I also wanted to let you know that Carla is my friend, not that you care, but we went to graduate school together at University of Pennsylvania, and that's where I got to know her, and I'm very um, always so impressed by the vast amount of knowledge that Carla can access in her brain at one time. But she has an MD and a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. She is a Robert, has been a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar. She's board certified in internal medicine and palliative care. And she has a bioethics degree from the Union Graduate College, which is called something else now, apparently. She is an assistant professor of bioethics and an assistant professor of palliative care at University of Kansas Medical School. And with no further ado, please welcome my friend, the brilliant Carla Kearns. Can you hear me now? OK. Uh, so uh, I was just um, sympathizing with your exam schedule. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about CPR today um, and about do not resuscitate orders and how that um, plays out in medical practice. And I was not smart enough to bring the remote. Um, I also wasn't smart enough to get the grammar right on this, but um, nobody's paid me to say what I'm going to say. So where does CPR come from? It's kind of a really odd practice, the sort of pushing on people's chest to get their hearts started again. So it initially comes from practices designed in London in the 1760s and 1770s to revive people who were drowning in the Thames River. Um, this um, device that you have over here um, comes from bellows for um, starting and, um, and advancing fires in fireplaces. You know, you blow on the coals so that they, uh, they get uh, bigger um, flames. And they used it to push air into the lungs of folks who were drowning. Um, and as you move forward, you get a variety of strategies and tactics, most of which did not work very well until about the mid-20th century. Um, but attempts to, um, to blow air into people's mouths, uh, attempts to um, use movements of the arms in order to get um, patients uh, recovered. And then by about 1900, some groups start pushing on the chest. Um, it's really uh, in the 50s and 60s that we get modern CPR um, and we start to get um, reasonable rates of survival from CPR. What is reasonable? What, is, what can you expect if you do CPR on a patient out in the community? Um, what's their likelihood of surviving to hospital discharge? So good answers, 10, 20, 50. Um, yeah, so in a hospitalized patient, um, return of spontaneous circulation is about 40 to 50 percent. Um, in the community, it depends on a bunch of variables that, um, that are going to be pretty obvious. What do you think uh, are the biggest driving factors of people's survival if they just collapse on the street? Yeah, so time. So does somebody find them? Do they collapse in a field in the middle of nowhere and it's hours before they're found or days? Um, are, they, are they walking with someone down the street when they collapse and therefore um, they get uh, care right away? Um, what else? Yeah, so effectiveness of those compressions. Did the, um, was the CPR done well? What else? 
So I'm going to put a, a stick in um, in Seattle because Seattle's going to come back um, here in a minute. Um, what does Niagara Falls have to do with CPR and resuscitation? So drowning is an excellent point. Yeah, so that would be um, the equivalent of, um, of what was going on in the Thames. Um, and certainly uh, drowning is, um, is critical. Drowning is actually the leading cause of cardiac arrest in children. Um, it's almost always a respiratory cause in kids. It's almost always a cardiac cause in adults. Um, and, uh, and so that's really important. Um, actually, it's the electricity. So they had this problem. Niagara Falls and Windsor, Canada, um, nearby, were the first electrified cities in the world because the hydropower from the Niagara River was able to be harnessed into, um, into electric power um, a, just before 1900. Um, so they get electric streetlights um, as opposed to gas lights, um, which is what, uh, what we had before that. Um, they start to get electric lights in their homes, again, as opposed to, um, to light in the evenings coming from burning flames of various kinds. Um, you know, whale oil lamps and, um, and gas lamps and candles um, get replaced in the early 20th century, and it really makes things much safer, makes fires much less likely. Um, but you had to have guys laying those power lines, laying the lines uh, underground or, um, or above ground. Um, and occasionally, one of the linemen would die. Young, healthy guys um, doing hard uh, physical work would just die. What happened to them? Yeah, they were electrocuted. So the, um, the electric companies figured out pretty quickly um, by looking at accident reports that some guys um, came back. And that what happened to the guys who came back is they got a second shock. And they went to an engineering professor at um, Johns Hopkins, and they said, can you make us a device to give the second shock? so that we can revive these guys. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, they just um, went into v ventricular fibrillation. Um, EKGs are really just being, um, being standardized at this time. Um, in, uh, by about 1920, we've got the standard EKG. Um, and so they want to be able to save these young men who are otherwise healthy. Um, and so they develop, um, Cowan Hoven develops the, um, the first uh, AC defibrillator um, and saves electric linemen all over. Um, they continue to work on this because um, one of the cardiac surgeons they work with says, huh, if we could stop the heart in a controlled fashion, maybe we could operate on it. Maybe we could fix valves. Maybe we could fix blood vessels. Maybe we could do, and you get the growth of cardiac surgery, but before you can have cardiac surgery, you got to be able to stop the heart and restart it, and you got to be able to do cardi cardiac bypass, which is a whole different technology. Um, so they continue to work on this. Um, this initial device um, that uh, was, um, these are internal paddles. Um, and so they work for a long time on a device where you can do the shock from the outside, external paddles. Um, eventually come up with this machine. Those paddles were so heavy, they were about 10 pounds each, um, that they noticed that, um, that just the pressure that they seemed to put on the chest, especially if you put them down a few times, seemed to improve survival. And they realized that um, compressions to circulate the blood um, was going to be an important part of reviving people. And so by, um, by about 1960, they have figured out modern CPR. And they figured out defibrillation, although the devices to use it are still so big, so cumbersome, so prone to, um, to challenges that they're not really able to use them. But um, they start doing it in the 1960s. And one of the hospitals here in Kansas City um, is an early user of defibrillation in the cardiac care unit. Um, and the challenge they had when they first 
started to do defibrillating of patients in the, in the cardiac care unit is who's going to do it? You got five minutes and the cardiologist is at home. They had to train the nurses to do it. Um, and there was a big uproar, I am told, by the 90-something-year-old cardiologist who was involved um, because, um, because that was pretty scary for the, um, for the nursing staff. Um, you know, the cardiologist is at home. They can get him on the phone, but he can't look at the EKG. Um, and so they had to teach the nurses to read EKGs, which now a coronary care nurse is better at reading an EKG than most doctors. Um, so you get, um, you get a number of um, tweaks along the way, um, first demonstrating that the air that I'm breathing out actually has enough oxygen um, to maintain somebody who's in cardiac arrest, mouth-to-mouth um, -mouth resuscitation, um, and then the formalized protocol for CPR um, in 1960. And in, um, through the 1960s, they start to recognize what the doctors and nurses recognized here in Kansas City in the coronary care unit. If you've got five minutes, teaching doctors is not going to be enough. You got to teach patients, you got to teach family members, you got to teach community members, you got to teach the firemen. If, if we're going to save lives, then whoever is with the patient at the time that they go into cardiac arrest has to be able to provide CPR. And so in 1972, uh, Leonard Cobb starts mass training the population of Seattle, Washington in CPR. Um, they train 100,000 people in the first couple years. Um, Seattle is a place where CPR training gets put into the public schools. Um, huge numbers of the population have training in CPR. And to this day, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest survival rates in the country are highest in Seattle. So it actually works. Um, in uh, 1974, Heimlich, who just recently died um, last year, uh, develops the um, Heimlich maneuver. Again, a strategy for lay people being able to save each other when there's not a medical professional around. Um, so here's, um, here's now your protocol that you guys are all going to memorize um, in uh, most likely in your third year. Um, about how to do CPR, um, and a whole set of strategies for f how to figure out what's wrong. Because you can revive the person, but unless you figure out what's wrong, um, they may just go right back into it. Um, you've got uh, what uh, the Heart Association calls the chain of survival. So again, the early intervention, the bystander CPR, um, the uh, 911 access. Anybody know when 911 finally became national? So the emergency phone number goes into use in about the 1970s. But um, who grew up in, um, in rural Missouri or rural Kansas? Yeah, so I grew up in a town in upstate New York where we had four-digit phone dialing until the mid-1980s. And we didn't get street addresses until um, the mid-90s. And the reason we needed street addresses was 911 service. Because before that, you'd call the fire department and you'd say, hey, can you come to the, um, well, first, you're going to come to the intersection of Gage Road and Sherwood Hill Road. Um, and we're going to be the fourth house up on the right. And when you do that, you will get an ambulance. But even though it was a 15-minute drive from the, um, the fire department to the house, when my mother actually had to call an ambulance, it was 45 minutes. Luckily, it was a broken leg and not a cardiac arrest, because if it was a cardiac arrest, she's dead by then. Um, so you, um, you get huge changes um, in order to implement this nationally. Um, survival from out-of-hospital arrest, so all heart rhythms um, is, uh, and this is EMS treated, so not all comers. Um, again, uh, about a quarter of them are dead before anybody is able to intervene. Um, but uh, for all heart rhythms, uh, if the EMS gets to you, your survival is about 11% nationally. Um, but if you have a bystander witness shockable rhythm, it goes up th uh, threefold. Um, besides um, the streets of Seattle, the other best place to have your cardiac arrest, Chicago's O'Hare Airport. 
um, which turns out to have actually a very large number of um, trained medical professionals flying in and out. The AMA is, um, is based there, so there's some other professional societies based there. There's lots of, um, of um, medical centers, hospitals, universities, pharmaceutical companies. And um, survival from uh, out-of-hospital rest at O'Hare is almost 50%. Um, so that's where you, you should send your grandfather who, you know, just kidding. Um, so car cardiac arrest is still the third leading cause of death in the United States, and survival um, out in the community is only about 6%. Um, survival um, to hospital discharge if you arrest in the hospital um, is almost a quarter, um, again, because of quick um, access to care. Um, and it continues to improve with the implementation of rapid response teams. Does anybody know what a rapid response team is? So they, um, they've started about 15, 20 years ago um, in hospitals in Australia, Britain, and the US. And they are teams that are able to be called by the bedside nurse most typically when their patient becomes unstable. So in, the principle is pretty simple. Instead of waiting for the patient's vital signs to crash and them to lose their pulse, it turns out that for the six hours prior to that episode of cardiac arrest, um, signs and symptoms become apparent that this patient is not doing well. And if you intervene at that point, rather than waiting for them to lose their pulse, you're much more likely to have a good outcome. Um, so they, um, they look at combinations of vital sign abnormalities, um, uh, signs and symptoms, you know, loss of consciousness or altered consciousness, um, you know, your heart rate too fast or too slow, your breathing rate too fast or too slow. Um, but the most reliable indicator of a patient who is going to crash um, and who would benefit from intervention is actually an experienced nurse calls you and says, this patient doesn't look right. Um, better than any of the quantitative um, scores we have yet been able to come up with for a fairly simple reason. That nurse is thinking about the last patient she saw who looked like that or he saw who looked like that and saying, I, that didn't go well. I'm afraid this isn't going to go well. So, um, so when you guys get to be house staff, the nurse calls and says, I don't like the way Mr. Jones works, looks. That's a sign to run because she's, I've just never seen it be wrong. Um, so, but most people are at home when they have their cardiac arrests and um, the, one of the biggest uh, risk factors for dying is living alone and just having nobody find you. Um, if you look at death rates uh, around the United States, um, red is bad, white is good. What do you notice? Yeah, so they call that the cardiac belt or the stroke belt, um, epidemiologically. Yeah. Well, I think also uh, it, it's kind of skewed in the sense that uh, a lot of, uh, you know, to state the obvious, a lot of uh, civilians retired from the war. Secondly, uh, it, it, uh, uh, the other states, for instance, in the north, they aren't as heavily populated. Uh, and, you know, I guess there is a bit of confounding. So I would certainly agree with you that there aren't that, there probably isn't anybody living in that part of Montana. Um, they did age adjust these um, rates. Um, and so the, the strategy of age adjusting is to try, what they literally do is, um, is set a baseline and say, okay, let's imagine every state actually has an age distribution that is what the whole United States is. So if these were crude rates as opposed to age-adjusted rates, yes, Florida really should be um, all red. Um, but they've, um, they've accommodated to the fact that, um, that what, you're, what you're doing is saying, OK, we'll take the rate of death from cardiac disease in 85-year-olds in Florida, but apply that to the national age distribution. And that allows you to, um, to adjust for the fact that people are, there are older retirees in Florida, there are older retirees in Maine. Turns out Pennsylvania um, and West Virginia have relatively old populations, not because 
old people move there, but because young people move away. Um, and that's true in a number of states. Um, you also are going to be running into issues where medical care may be further away. Um, it, rural communities where there's not good access or where there's not good ambulance service, um, transport times can be long. Um, all of those play into it. If I, um, if I put a map of obesity in the United States up, it would look just like this too. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and poverty too, right. So it turns out that the social determinants of health are intertwined. Um, and if I, put, um, if I put either the inputs, poverty, lack of access to health care, uninsurance, or if I put the outputs, stroke, heart disease, um, infant mortality, they would all produce the, basically the same map. Um, yeah, <laughs> not expanding Medicaid. Um, we could talk about that too. Um, uh, so, um, and interestingly, um, these are the areas where you get your organ fastest if you end up on an organ transplant list because of all those car accident and stroke patients and cardiac patients whose organs suddenly become available. So it's not necessarily so good to be a place where the organ uh, list is short. Um, so uh, survival rates vary by, um, by the kinds of factors we've been talking about, epidemiology, health system factors, community factors, factors about, um, about where people live and who people live. Um, and the survival rate from out of hospital rest in Seattle is 15%, more than twice as good as the national average, basically two and a half times. Um, Detroit, East St. Louis, kind of the places you would expect, rural Mississippi, um, don't do as well. And it's, um, it's predominantly those lack of resources. When we looked at um, cardiac arrest survival in Atlanta, um, when we first did it, and this is, this is really important for health disparities overall. When we first did it, it showed that African Americans were twice as likely to die as white patients um, from cardiac arrest if we just put in individual demographics. But if we put in a factor to adjust for the neighborhood in which the cardiac arrest happened, the race um, difference disappears because it turns out to be all attributable to neighborhood effects, which are still race, but it's more about resources. It's not that the same doctors and nurses are treating the black patients and the white patients different, by and large. It can happen, but by and large, that's not what's going on. What's going on is if you get taken to a good hospital, you get good medical care. And if you get taken to an overwhelmed hospital that takes six, eight hours to see you, you don't do as well. Um, and so thinking about how we can, um, can improve access to EMS service, hospital service, et cetera, um, is likely to serve our communities um, better um, in all kinds of ways. Um, and then rural areas also have lower survival. Um, this is, um, these are the cities that are participating in a registry. Every 911 call in these communities is, um, is tracked from uh, the 911 service um, out to hospital discharge to see what we can do to improve survival. Um, the green um, states, their whole state is participating. Um, and in other places, it's, um, it's particular cities that are participating. Um, and they have, um, they found bystander CPR um, and uh, quick transport and then a uh, number of other things to be um, really important to survival. Um, bystander CPR training. Again, Washington um, is, uh, is big, but, um, but uh, all these places trying to improve access. Um, now you can get an app on your phone. If it's been a while since you've updated your CPR training, um, it'll actually talk you through it, um, as well as, uh, as getting you um, access to, uh, to help. Um, and of course, um, if, uh, if you're really concerned, um, you've got uh, access to defibrillators in the community now at swimming pools, um, airports. That's the other big thing about O'Hare. They're one of the first places to get public access to fibrillation. Um, or you can buy one on Amazon for about 1500 bucks um, if, uh, say, your grandma is visiting. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs>
So um, heart attacks, uh, we, uh, we think of as plumbing problems and cardiac arrests are electrical problems with electrical solutions. Um, I also like that one. Um, so where do my patients get the idea about how things are going to go if we do CPR? Yeah, I heard movies, television, um, maybe the newspaper, maybe other places. Um, so uh, this tells you something that um, I trust your cardiology folks already taught you, um, that VFib and VTAC are your shockable rhythms, the ones most likely to be survivable. Um, asystole is basically a pre-mortem rhythm. Um, and the problem with PEA is you got to figure out what's wrong. Um, and uh, that can be really challenging. The differential diagnosis for PEA, it's a great internist's code um, because if you can figure out what's wrong um, and fix it, then, uh, then you can bring the patient back. Um, so uh, just as we were saying, in-hospital cardiac arrests have much better survival rates than out-of-hospital cardiac arrests. However, they're much sicker patients um, so survival to hospital discharge um, is actually uh, still only about a third of patients who get a rhythm back, whereas survival to hospital discharge is better for community members who get a rhythm back. There's not, not as likely to have underlying sepsis, multi-organ failure, cancer, um, or other reasons um, that are not fixable um, as the reason for their arrest. Um, and uh, in the community, they are often non-cardiac causes, things like um, car accidents, electrocution, drowning. Um, and uh, we all need to do a better job. So I'm going to leave that. So what did my patients learn from, what show is this? I know it's off the air now. ER. ER. What did my patients learn from ER? See, you would think that. You would. Um, so there is a very well-cited study of CPR on television um, that uh, John Lantos, um, who's over at Children's Mercy, and a couple of his colleagues did when he was in Chicago. Uh, they looked at the first season of Chicago Hope, um, which is another show that's been off the air now for a while, um, the first season of ER, um, and a season of Rescue 911. And they found about a 75% survival rate. So we just said you know, survival to hospital discharge is 6% in the community, 24% in the hospital. So 75% seems a little high, um, or 67%. Um, if, uh, if you want to find out more about uh, doctors and medicine on television, this is a, actually a really awesome book. Um, it goes back to, um, to the 1930s to some of the earliest movies of like Dr. Kildare and stuff. Um, and goes through the last generation of, um, of shows. Um, and what it shows really is that um, the television shows use medicine as a source of drama, duh, um, a source of, um, of mystery, soap operas. General Hospital was a radio show before it was a soap opera. Um, and birth and death um, and medical crisis make good television. Um, but they... Um, they only recently have taken reality and verisimilitude as their goals. Um, and so rec just starting to recognize that, that Dr. Kildare was not intended to represent medicine um, as it was actually practiced. It was an ideal for medicine. Um, so uh, a research assistant, uh, a resident, and I um, looked at uh, actually all episodes, uh, all the seasons of ER, um, going back through season 15, um, House, Grey's Anatomy, and we also did Scrubs. Um, <laughs> um, I, the, uh, the, the research assistant watched every episode, and she complained to me afterwards that she could no longer watch medical television, um, but uh, I paid her for the summer. Um, so, yeah, so the different shows represent different settings and different specialties. So you would expect different outcomes. Patients on ER are much more likely to be young, victims of trauma, uninsured, um, you know, consistent with uh, a Chicago trauma center. Gray's Anatomy is a private hospital in Seattle. So even though they still get trauma, um, our doctors are all surgeons. 
Um, sometimes you kind of scratch your head. The surgeons are managing this childbirth. The surgeons are managing this. Hmm. Don't they have any internists or psychiatrists or um, OBs? Okay, whatever. Um, and um, and of course, and house. Um, what are they suffering from? Yeah, something weird. Yeah. Great question. So um, there's not as much data that follows patients out that far, but it's about half of the patients who survive hosp hospital discharge will be alive in a year. Um, because whatever caused their heart to stop, unless it was trauma, drowning, something that is transient, is um, likely to recur. Um, similarly, um, they may not die of a heart attack, but anybody who's got cardiovascular disease is also likely to have cerebrovascular disease, is also likely to have renal disease. Um, and so vascular disease is a, a systemic problem throughout the body, and most of those patients will die a cardiovascular or, car or cerebrovascular death, um, the ones who, who die within that year. If you looked out five years, I think you're probably talking about only... Um, 20% of those folks who survived the hospital who are still alive. Again, most of those are going to be older, middle-aged or older patients um, who are dying of cardiovascular death. Great question. Um, so uh, there is not a medical school at Princeton, New Jersey. Um, I think the, uh, the building they always show is actually a student center, I'm told. Um, so they didn't do so bad, actually. Um, you know, ER, 40% survival, survival to, um, to the end of the episode, which is the best we could do. Um, we couldn't do end of season. Um, you know, so 45% and 15% is about what you see in, um, in real life. Uh, ER is just a touch lower than that. Gray's Anatomy is just a touch lower than that. So that's pretty reasonable. Um, and also pretty reasonable for the populations they, um, they looked at. We actually looked at the rhythms also, that they um, report were reported to have, um, and consistent with good medicine, folks with VF and VT were much more likely to survive than folks with PEA or asystole. Um, House, uh, well, House knows what's wrong with you, so he's going to save you. And basically, if he gets your pulse back, you're going to leave the clinic or the hospital or wherever it is he's actually practicing. Um, so, but. I mean, house and ER prized reality, so they represented reality reasonably well. Um, many of the, um, the resuscitations are unmonitored, so we didn't have a rhythm. Um, uh, asystole was a pretty common rhythm to see, and that's common in real life, too. PEA arrest is a, is a little complicated to explain on television because the, um, the rhythm looks normal on the monitor, but the patient's in cardiac arrest, and so they, they just don't do that, even though... In internal medicine and ICU patients, it is a pretty common rhythm. Um, they shocked all of them, including asystole, which, and the asystole patients didn't do so well. Um, the research assistant also noted fairly quickly that um, the rhythm on the monitors actually being shown often did not match the rhythm in the dialogue, because apparently for the props people only had um, sinus and asystole. Um, so they, they would occasionally show VT or VF, but not usually. Usually the patient was either alive or dead from the props point of view. I guess you can understand. Um, and uh, the diagnoses that are represented on the shows are consistent with what you would expect. So lots of weird zebras on house, um, lots of trauma um, on uh, ER and Gray's Anatomy. Um, and uh, they relatively seldom discuss disability after CPR, which is pretty common. Um, this, though, really bothered us. So out of the 115 arrests on ER, five of them had a DNR order in place. And in four out of five, they followed the DNR order. In the fifth case, it was a former staff member of the ER who was not known to have a DNR um, in place when they uh, resuscitated him. 
um, creating the opportunity for everybody to feel bad and, um, and lots of dramatic um, and, uh, and difficult conversations. Um, in Gray's Anatomy, there were four DNR orders, and only one of them is actually followed. Because on Gray's Anatomy, your doctors and nurses love you too much to let you go, even if that was your wish. Um, does anybody remember the episode that uh, where they did honor the DNR order? That's okay. Um, it was a cliffhanger at the end of the season. Um, the uh, the ER uh, or the um, the woman had cancer, had a DNR order um, that was very well established. That those were her wishes. Her husband begged them to resuscitate her. They did not. And he came back the next episode and shot the place up. So honoring your patient's stand order, definitely the right thing to do. Um, and on house, he doesn't honor them either because um, he says, no, the diagnosis that led you to decide to be DNR is wrong, and I'm going to save you, which he does. So you watch this, and who's going to be DNR? Either your doctor's wrong, your doctor doesn't care about you, um, or you come into an urban trauma center and, you know, like shit happens, right? Um, so uh, this tells you what I just told you. Um, oh, and uh, sorry, I don't have the, um, the data up here on, um, on Scrubs. Um, what do you think compared to the other shows? Um, yeah, so like 5% survival, um, and most of the time it's really just a body um, and a lot of angst. <laughs> um, so I've only actually uh, once or twice had a patient or family member cite to me, but I thought it worked so much better when I had a conversation with them about do not resuscitate. Um, and um, most of the time these kinds of things are going to be sub rosa. It's not going to be something they talk about. Um, but really giving people a clear sense of what is CPR for and is it going to help you? Um, and for most of our cardiac patients um, who are not end stage, it is the right thing to do. And for most of our young and healthy patients, it is the right thing to do. For most of our patients with metastatic cancer or multi-organ failure, um, it probably isn't the right thing to do. Um, but you really have to have that conversation in the larger context of what's going on with them. Um, a lot of times when I have a young patient who is dying, and even if they understand they're dying, CPR becomes symbolic of hope. And even if a, as I've had a couple patients in the last few months who even as I'm sending them to hospice and they understand that we don't expect them to survive the week, they want us to try to bring them back. And don't and it's really hard to explain that what we're going to bring you back to probably isn't what you want. Um, but it's really important to have these conversations um, with patients who you're following long term, um, with patients where you have a chance to have a discussion. Uh, one of the hospitals I've worked at in the last 10 years um, had made sure that you could have your DNR conversation and that you had the right resuscitation status for every patient by setting up a, um, a, a block and break the glass in the e electronic medical record. You couldn't order anything until you had set a, a DNR status. No lunch, no breakfast, no labs, no x-rays. Everybody had to have a, um, a, a DNR status first which meant that everybody got put in the computer as full code and only changed later because I'm, I'm not going to have the DNR conversation with you before I order you breakfast. That's not fair. Um, so, um, so asking about the patient's preferences um, in a broader context is really the, the thing I want you to get out of that. Um, explaining that um, CPR is traumatic and it, it's going to break the ribs if it's done right. Explaining that if grandma is dying, um, we want her to be surrounded by family, not strangers. 
um, and uh, and ensuring that that the folks that you're working with understand if we could save your mom, we would. This is only the situation where we know we can't. And sometimes that's hard to admit even to ourselves. Um, if a person may be anticipated to have a decline in health, that's really the important time to have this conversation. So often I'll be having a conversation about goals of care and, um, and CPR and hospice in somebody who's getting better. Let's say you have end-stage COPD and you're in the ICU and we got you off the ventilator and now you are awake and alert. And I'll sit down with you and your family and I'll say, I'm really glad you're getting better. That's awesome. It's really important for us to know for the future whether you would want to do this again. Because when you're in that spot, when you're short of breath like you were this time, you're not going to be able to tell your family. You're not going to be in a position to talk to them. And they really need to hear from you what it is that they should do when the doctor in the ER says, should we put them on the breathing machine? These are really hard conversations for families to have. And I am totally not above um, saying, you know, what we see after families lose somebody is that the, the kids who knew what their dad wanted and were able to advocate for that, whatever it is, do much better. It's the folks who didn't know what dad want who feel guilty six months later, who are still questioning six months later, what should they have done? So it's really a gift to your family, a gift to your kids um, to tell them what they should do when they're in the ER with you that day. Um, and those conversations really help people understand this isn't about being, about ac accepting death. You know, that's a different conversation. This is about empowering your family to advocate for you um, so that what we do is what you would want us to do. Um, here's some, um, some more places to go for, uh, for scripts for how to have those conversations, and I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Questions? Sure. Um, so uh, my clinical practice is um, in palliative care, palliative medicine, and I practice only in the hospital. So I do palliative care consultation. Um, my colleagues um, will also see patients in hospice, either home hospice or in hospice facilities, um, folks who are in nursing homes on hospice. Um, but I'm, I'm at the sort of sending folks point. Um, and so we will be involved in a patient's care um, at all phases of illness, potentially. Um, there are places where when you get diagnosed with lung cancer, um, you get an oncologist and a palliative care doctor. Um, and even while we're trying to cure your cancer um, or um, put it at bay, we also have somebody who's focused on um, pain, symptom management, um, nausea, anxiety, fatigue, um, and also on having these conversations and making plans so that when, um, when something happens, you have designated a decision maker and you've had some conversations with that person or those people so that they know, again, what you would want so that they can advocate for what you would want. Um, so in the hospital, um, I'd say a third of our consults are from oncology, about a third are from ICU. Um, a fraction are from neurological ICU, stroke patients. Um, some of them are folks with multi-organ failure. Um, some of them are, um, are folks at earlier stages of illness. Um, and our goal is to support whatever treatment plan that the patient and um, family and primary specialist has created with those goals of improving communication, symptom management, um, and advanced care planning. Um, so we will follow along. And sometimes we'll get called on, say, a patient who had 
uh, a ruptured triple A um, aortic aneurysm who is in the surgical ICU and might do well or might not do well. Um, they'll call us fairly early in the hospital stay and we'll sort of follow along. And if they're doing well, we'll say, you know, bless you, that's great. And if they aren't doing well, we're familiar faces already for that tough conversation about should we take them off the ventilator so that it's not a situation where we're coming in only after the primary team has said there's nothing more we can do for you. Do me a favor. Take that out of your vocabulary. There is never nothing more we can do for you. We can always help you with your symptoms. We can always help your family. We can always help with coping. We can always set up for home care. Um, nothing more we can do for you is incredibly devastating news. We can no longer cure your cancer, but we want to help you live as long and as comfortable a life as, um, as you have left, but not never, nothing we can do. Um, Yeah. It's a really great question with a long essay answer. Um, the first part is, um, is I call my pediatric colleagues because they face this a lot more. Um, and the neonatal ICU situation or the prenatal devastating diagnosis situation is somewhat different than, say, the five-year-old who's a drowning victim or an abuse victim. Um, which is again different than the teenager with cystic fibrosis um, or cancer who is able to be part of that conversation. Um, so the first thing is recognizing um, that we in this country have an expectation of living a long and relatively healthy life and dying in our 70s or 80s. And any death that is out of that cycle is much harder. So um, deaths of young adults as well as deaths of children. And you really want to start with empathizing with the parents with how unfair this is, how, how hard this is, how difficult um, the decisions that we're, we're dealing with are. Um, if the kid is not of an age or um, maturity to participate, then you're really having a conversation with the parents about what is in their best interest. If, if you truly believe that they're not acting in their best interest, what our pediatric colleagues have taught me is it's not enough to think this isn't the decision I would make. You really only challenge parents in a situation where this decision is not justifiable. This decision, the decision that they're making is borderline abusive. Um, and those cases they take quite happily to court, um, whether it's chemotherapy that's being refused or a blood transfusion for a Jehovah's Witness that's being refused, um, which um, the case law on those is very clear. You just get a court order and do it. Um, it's, you know, what do you do with that cystic fibrosis patient who um, who is more borderline? And that really is a negotiation. And the biggest thing is supporting the family um, so that they are in a position to reason through what's going on. Um, the other thing is really accepting the fact that um, even if it isn't a decision we would make, it may be the right decision for them. But my... One of my friends is pediatric and adult trained in palliative medicine, and she really struggles. And she tells me, we really do put kids through a lot more than we do um, adults. We really allow parents to continue kids on life support when if this was an 80-year-old 
everybody would be up in arms that it's time to stop. But because it's a four-year-old and the parents want to continue, we let them. Um, and they, the pediatricians really struggle with that. Um, but they, they, they feel on the whole that challenging the adult, uh, challenging the parents is usually not going to be productive in, in continuing to work with them. So unless there's a sort of clear goal, like I said, getting a court order for a blood transfusion, they tend to avoid legal intervention at all costs. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.